Today on The Grid, it's Flash Q&A Day, and we're talking about Flash gear and the 10 most asked questions we get asked about Flash. Broadcasting for Grid is brought to you by Tamron. Check out their 28 to 75 millimeter f2.8 lens. It's for Sony full frame mirrorless. It's awesome. Go to tamron-usa.com. And Profoto, the light shaping company. Check out the Profoto B1X, powered all the right places. Go to profoto.com slash US. And Platypod, the tripod alternative that is changing the world. Everybody has a Platypod. You should too. Go to platypod.com. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another live episode of The Grid. We are broadcasting. <laughs> and we miss everybody. Uh, hey, Mr. Kuna, how you doing? Great. How you doing, Scott? Oh, good. You look like you were frozen frozen there for a second. Frozen Kuna. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm here. I've got my Aloha Oe going on today, <laughs> and uh, it, am I frozen? Is my am I frozen on screen? Because I feel frozen. It it is not frozen, but it's definitely uh, more stuttery today. Put it that way. Well, I've turned off anything that might be streaming from here. <laughs> yeah. Uh oh. But we're talking we're talking flash today, right? So we're uh, ask, ask or answering questions about anything they have about uh, flash, um, anything to do with flash. Um, I've got some questions for you that have uh, come over the uh, we've just collected over the last uh, few months about flash that uh, come up uh, again and again. So um, I think we're just gonna be talking all about flash, right? Okay. Yeah, that's that's what we're doing today uh, in a very stuttered way. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, we do have some giveaways today because we're talking about Flash. We're giving away three copies. And get it away. So we'll be giving those away courtesy of our friends at Rocky Nook and my uh, in-house editor, Kim Doty, who is always on the ball. And she's like, you guys are talking about Flash. we got to give away... Hey, before Eric, before we get into the questions, a uh, couple important things. If mm -hmm. I'm, if my stream is coming through at all, I don't, I'm, I'm just crossing my fingers. Uh, I heard, uh, I heard you, but I think uh, it cut out a little bit that uh, we're giving away copies of the Flash book. But yes. everybody saw you hold up the Flash book, so that's cool. Oh, okay, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're giving that away, and uh, let's see what else. We uh, a week from today we'll track event coming up May fifth and sixth. Hundreds of photographers all over the world have already signed up. You should come too. It's going to be a lot of fun, and we've got all the big names uh, in the Lightroom world are going to be there teaching. And uh, okay, let's do that. All right. So, so, so um, Scott's having some uh, some freezing issues here. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to have Scott um, call back in uh, to the control room at another location. And um, we're going to take a short break, have Scott call back in, and hopefully uh, that will fix the problem. So we'll be right back in just a couple minutes talking all about Flash. Is the tripod dead? Sure, a tripod works for basic shots, but who wants to be basic? You don't need basic, you need Blockbuster. And that's a job for a Platypod. The Platypod is your go-anywhere, do-anything flat tripod base. Its compact design helps you discover unique angles that you could never reach with a typical tripod. So, whether you're bringing up baby, driving Miss Daisy, or with your beasts of the southern wild, 
you can capture big budget footage and stills for a fraction of the time and money. So go ahead, shoot the next Rocky or Birdman. Or on the waterfront, the Platypod is equipped to grip uneven surfaces and hang from just about anything. When tripods go low, the Platypod goes lower. Its flat base reaches the lowest possible angle, resulting in truly inventive shots that can't be replicated with traditional equipment. And if you feel like adding a dramatic overhead angle, the Platypod has you covered. Just strap it or screw it in, and you're ready to go within minutes. The Platypod is constructed from aircraft-grade aluminum and titanium. Yeah, the stuff Air Force One is made of. So, it's durable enough to travel with you from Chinatown to Casablanca and everywhere in between. If you only take the tripod, the story ends. You wake up the next morning with nothing but basic footage. Or you could take the Platypod to a museum, or on an elevator, or strap it to a tree, or hang it on a bench at church, or put it on the ground and get incredible blockbuster footage. Who are we kidding? You should totally take the Platypod. The tripod is not dead, but it needs a sidekick. The Platypod. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by b &H Photo, the professional source since 1973. All okay, right, any back. better? <laughs> I'm hoping that's better. Yeah, I'm hearing you, so that's good. Oh, okay. Well, uh, thanks to everybody that stuck through all that. <laughs> so, beautiful so let, people, let are we ready to do let, some... Let me let me start here, Scott. So I, I'll just start with some common questions, and then um, sure. Then maybe we could dig into some uh, more complex ones as they come in uh, from the chat and the community. Uh, but sure. uh, first question I have for you is, um, you know, a lot of people um, have like a Canon flash or a Nikon flash. Can you use uh, a Yong Nuo or Photix wireless trigger with your Canon flash? Yeah, man, I get this question a lot. So here's kind of what you need to do. Unfortunately, I know that the, like the Nikon brand and the Canon brand flash triggers are expensive. But if you already own a Canon flash with wireless in it, you're going to need to buy a Canon trigger. You can't go buy another brand's trigger. They will not work together. So if you buy a Yongnuo flash, you can buy a Yongnuo trigger. If you have a Canon flash, you need to go buy a Canon brand trigger. And I, and I understand that you, you want to use the Photix because it's so easy to use, or you want to use one of the, like the Pro Photos or any of the ones that are really, really easy to use. Because the Canon one is, it's a little sticky. I mean, you, you get used to it. It's, it's just not as easy to use as the other ones. It's one of the things I think that when Canon is looking at, what are we going to do in our downtime? redesigning their transmitter might be one of them it does work it works well it's just yep it's a lot of digging through menus where some of the newer ones you just push a button and it makes it just a whole lot easier that being said to answer the question yeah you got to use the same brand receiver now you could technically go to pocket wizard and pocket wizard sells little triggers for example, one goes on top of your hot shoe and then you take your hot, your flash and you put it inside this on your light stand. And that way, you know, you're talking. 
it will make that flash work. Outside of that workaround, you really unfortunately need to buy the one that matches your internal flash. So don't get burned by going and buying one of those other ones and finding it simply will not trigger your flash. Or, or if it triggers it, I mean, you can t set any flash to slave mode, and if it sees a flash of light, it'll go off. But you won't be able to turn it on, turn it off, raise the power, all that stuff. Uh, like, that's what you really want the wireless trigger for, for all of that. So long answer is, well, the short version of the long answer is, buy the one that matches your brand. Sorry. Okay, there you go, Mr. Kuna. Now, does that same thing go, because we got some people asking that, does that same thing go for Nikon flash? Same thing? Yeah, I'm just using Canon as an example, because that's what I'm used to, and that's what I have. But yeah, you need to buy the Nikon trigger, because you're not going to be able to fire your Nikon brand flash using a Fotix trigger. It's, it, it's If you're a Sony user, you're not going to be able to fire your Sony flash using a Yong Nuo or a Go to Go to, to Go Docs or whatever, you're not going to be able to do that. You're going to need to buy their matching brand. All right, so I got another question for you, Scott. So about sure. flash. So um, uh, why do we need to add uh, gels when you're shooting outside? And it, and to kind of follow up about the gels, what do you recommend if we need to use these gels outside? Okay, so it's a weird psychological reason why we have to use them, but it's this. When we're shooting inside a studio, like if I was taking a portrait in here, we're used to seeing white light. White light is what we see indoors and, you know, like uh, fluorescent lights and things like that. So when we see a flash go off and the light color is white indoors with a gray background or a white background or something, it looks natural to us. It doesn't look weird. However, when you go outdoors, right, when you go outdoors, people, their skin looks bluish when you use flash outdoors. A white light looks weird. It just doesn't look right. And think about it. Think about back to when you were a kid. When you drew the sun, you put a circle on the, your coloring, right? You put a circle on the page. What color do you make the sun? Orange or yellow, right? So when someone's outdoors and the light looks white, it doesn't look right. We expect it to look some kind of a warm color. So what we do is we put a very, very, very thin sheet of gel over the front of the flash. You can tape it on. You can buy expensive systems, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But that little thin, and, and it is like one quarter, it's called a one quarter cut, a very thin piece of gel. It's not going to make your people look orange. It's just going to make them look natural and the light will look right and they'll look healthy. People look better, warmer, right? So just keep, anytime I walk out the door and I know I'm going location, I'm going to put a very, very thin piece of gel. Now, if you're shooting as it gets later in the day where the sun would turn very, very yellow, like you're at sunset or something, you'll have to actually tape another piece of gel and maybe another piece of gel and maybe even a fourth to where you have a full cut of orange on there and it's really, really orange. And, and the way to know how to add an extra gel is anytime you're shooting and you notice that the light looks white, it's time to add another sheet of gel. So that's why we do it, because it, it looks more natural to our eye. Our eyes are used to white light indoors. We're not used to it outdoors. Okay, so that's why we need gel. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can go. One way is to just buy a sheet of gel. B&H sells a sheet of gel for, I want to say, $7.95, and it's a big sheet. It's a big 22 inches by 28. It's a big old sheet. Take a pair of scissors, cut them up, and then tape it right over the front of your flash if you have gaffer's tape, uh, that's good. Hey, can I show you something? Am I logged on? Can like, yeah, I'm here, right? So I want to go to B and H and just show you something. All right. So T O J. Am I? Do you have my screen? I think. All so. right. So here's the stuff, and and here's the stuff I would get right here. The Roscoe. One quarter CTO. By the way, CTO. Oh no, they got it, my dude. screen up. No. I got. They got my screen. Oh, up. yeah. Don't don't do Eric's screen. <laughs> do my screen. Is my screen working? If not, I can bring it up. I know what you're talking about exactly. Because I use here. I'll stuff. I'll try it again. Maybe my I got logged out. Give me give me a sec here. I think I'll I'll try it again. Here we go. I got it. All right, you see on my screen now? All right, so here we are. 
So this is, look at this Roscoe gel, $6.95, even cheaper than I said. All right, and you want the one quarter cut. And the CTO stands for simply color temperature orange. It's a 20 by 24 sheet, big sheet. Look at the reviews, five star. All right, so when you click on this, I believe, let's go see. Let's go to the bottom of the page. <laughs> Look, there it is, gaffer tape. It's a recommended accessory. It's right there at the bottom. Now, this is two inches wide by 55 yards. You can get a, a smaller one that is, I think, one inch thick, and it's like literally $6 or $7. So get yourself some gaffer tape, a pair of scissors, make it the size of the, you know, of the front of your flash and just tape it on. This is the last year for five years. Now, there are other fancier ways that you can go. Um, a really nice system is from a company called MagMod. Let me show you theirs. I think we've talked about them before because I use their stuff. So it's not cheap. This is, is not cheap stuff, but it is very, very well made. It is a magnet system. So you see this little thing? There's a pretty good view of it right there. It fits over the front of your flash. It's like a rubber hood that fits over your flash like that. See how it's got a rubber hood? And then you can buy things that magnetically you just, woo, it sticks right to it like you can't believe. And one of the things that they sell are gels. They have a gel holder, your little gel, and it's a plastic pre-cut to size gel. It slides inside and there you go. So they have all kinds of different gels and you can buy colorful gels and all. See, they got a gel starter kit with gels, but you gotta buy, yeah, unfortunately, and I say that because it, it's true. <laughs> unfortunately, you can't just buy the grip. You have to buy like their basic kit. Let's go find their basic kit. And it's, it's, it is not, it's not cheap, but it's really good. Oh, come on, where's their basic kit? It's not the $409 wedding kit. That's not that one. But they do have a basic kit I want to say it's around a hundred bucks, not cheap. Wow. I can't find their basic kit. I just saw it the other day when I was looking for it. I've got it up on my screen. If you want to go to it, it's $189. It's just the flash kit. Is that what you're talking about there? Uh, no, they actually make one that is, here it is. The Magmog starter kit. Here it is. So this one, no, that's not the one it's got, it's, it's got a, it has a gel holder. And a grid. This is a different one. Hang on, it's here. We're gonna spend the whole show looking on B and H for a uh, for this. There it is, the basic kit right here. Now, this basic kit has the holder. It has a grid so that focuses the light from your flash. This is the holder for the gel, and it comes with eight gels, not shown here, but it does come with eight gels, and that includes different yellows and stuff. So. For 89 bucks, you do get that whole thing. And it's a really, really nice system because you're not messing with gels and tape and stuff. It's just, you just snap it on and snap it off. What else is nice is you can slap the grid on so you get a nice focused beam. You can slap the the other gel right on. They'll stack right on top of one another. So it's a really great system. Anyway, I hope that, that answers that question is why we use a gel and what would I recommend. It's the Mag Mods, I think, is a really good one. Can I give you one other while we're here? Um, yeah. uh, gel kit. It's from, uh, of course their name, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute. There it is right here. Rogue. So it's the rogue makes a kit for $29 and tell us, take a look at what it is. It is a bunch of pre-cut gels. They come in a little case. Look, it comes in a nice case. So you feel like you're from think tank. All right. You get a bunch of gels. And you get this rubber band. It's, I, I don't want to call it a rubber band. It's very much like those rubber bracelets that people wear. And what it does is you wrap it around your flash and these little ends of the flash the, of the gels stick inside there. So it works without having to use tape. And it just, here's a better picture of it. See how it just fits right over? There you go. It fits right over. And it's only 29 bucks. You get a whole bunch of gels. Well, you get all this. You get the gels, you get the holder, you get the <laughs> picture of the holder, <laughs> and you get a handy carrying case and gels for every occasion for 30 bucks. That's hard to beat. It's not magnetic. It's not as cool as the other one, 
but it works and it's very, very nice. It's 20 filters. Anyway, that's another set. Rogue, R-O-G-U-E, sell them at B&H, 29 bucks. And B&H is still open. They still ship and everything. Uh, you can't go in the store, of course, but they'll they'll ship to you. So there you go. All right, next question, Mr. Kuna. And also, so if you guys want to watch, if you have questions, send them in as well. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Yeah, here's another one to kind of follow up on the gel question. So if you use a gel to warm the light... Why can't you just change the white balance on your camera? Well, there, there are two different things. I want to set my white balance for what I'm trying to set it at. Like, for example, sometimes for sports, and this is a trick I picked up from Dave Black, you set your white balance to a very, very, very blue color, and then you put a very orange gel over your light, and it just it, it looks like sports cover of Sports Illustrated. It looks amazing. The When you change the white balance in your camera, you're changing the white balance for the entire scene. Well, I don't need, I don't want the whole scene to look yellow. I want the scene to look regular. I just want my light to look the right color. So changing the white balance makes everything yellow. I just want the light to be warmer. That's why we use a gel. Otherwise it changes the whole color of the scene. Hey, I got an easy answer in there. I didn't make it long and, and winded. So I get five points there you for go. that. So this is a, a big one. A big one is why do I have to shoot manual mode with flash? Okay. You don't, or do you don't I? absolutely do I? have to. It's just way easier. And there, here's the reason why. So there is a syncing that happens between a wireless flash or a wired flash, really, but and your shutter. When you press your shutter, the flash has to go off at the exact right moment. And, and that happens, but you know, your shutter is going to open and close. If they get out of sync, if your shutter speed gets too fast, what will happen is the, uh, the shutter won't get down in time and you will see Literally, if it was a picture of me, like look at my screen here, you would see a black, like almost like a black bar at the bottom. And the higher your shutter speed gets, the higher that bar will get until it's just black. And, and I'm it, I'm not using all the right terms there, but that, that's what happens. You get this gradient, you know, that, that happens. So it, by shooting in manual mode, you can go dial in a shutter speed. And the one that I recommend for flash is one 1 25th of a second. That is a shutter speed that will always stay in sync with almost any flash made. So it's one of those safe numbers you can do. You go to manual mode, you dial in one 1 25th of a second, you don't have to touch it again, and everything's good, and your flash stays in sync, and you don't have any issues. So that's why I always recommend to people shoot in manual mode so you can set your shutter speed and forget it. So and now there will, will be times that you might want to lower that shutter speed. You will rarely ever want to raise it and you can only raise it a little tiny bit. You might be able to go to one two hundredth of a second. You might be able to go to one two hundred and fiftieth of a second. It just depends on your flash making model. So to be safe, don't do that. Use 125th of a second and then you're in manual mode and everything's happy. I, I know that some people that are not used to manual mode are concerned about it. They're like, I don't really know how to shoot a manual. The only thing that's going to change is you're going to switch to manual, set to 125th of a second, and don't touch it again. So don't let that intimidate you or stop you from using flash because you have to use manual mode. It's actually easier because you're going to use manual mode. There we go. Uh, now... Um so Nando's in the chat, and he's asking Ooh, the question. Gee, Nando. Um, he's saying, well, what about high? What about high speed sync? Or why do you well, usually need to be low? Yeah, yeah. High speed sync is an entirely different. Um, it's a different thing. It's when you want to be able to shoot outdoors with flash in the middle of the day, and and you can actually tell your camera, okay. I need to shoot at a high shutter speed so I can shoot it like f 2.8 and put the background out of focus out in the middle of the day. 
And so what you can do is you just turn it on in your camera or in your flash, depends on how it's set up, but you're going to turn on high speed sync. And at that point, you're basically overriding that whole. Now, what you're thinking is, well, Scott, why isn't high speed sync just on all the time so we don't have to worry about this? There's a downside to high speed sync. When you turn on high speed sync, yes, it allows you to shoot it one four thousandths of a second, which you might have to do to be shooting out in the bright day. But it eats up battery like you cannot believe. Like you'll be burning through batteries. There, you're never going to see a shorter battery life in your life than when you're using high speed sync. So I think the camera companies do it because high speed sync is a very specialized. I'm doing a particular kind of shoot. I need a particular kind of f-stop. I'm doing these very intentional things, so I'm going to turn on a very special setting uh, for that. So I, th I think that's why it's not on by default. But yeah, high-speed sync is a whole separate thing for a very separate uh, case, but it works great. It really does work amazingly well. Just eats up batteries like a boss. So Rabino is asking a question from earlier. Rabino, um, clear up. Um, is uh she says uh my canon trigger takes too long to find the correct settings to talk to my canon flash they don't get along why where can i find the exact settings for my flash and i think that goes back well, to kind of your original thing yeah so do, so rubino do you have a canon flash and a canon transmitter cuz it yes, sounds that's what it sounds like it's a, she does have a canon flash that's what she says. That my Canon trigger takes too long to find the correct settings to talk to my Canon flash. Okay, yeah, there's something there's something else wrong. So what I would do there, because it, it literally should be no-brainer. This should be a five-second thing where you turn on your flash, you hit the sync button, it sees the other flash, and it syncs, and you're ready to start shooting. What you might want to do is go and find, you're going to have to go download the PDF uh, for your transmitter and maybe your flash too, but I think it's probably going to be your transmitter and reset your transmitter to its default settings. So all of these things that have menus generally have a thing just that says reset and it's somewhere along the line, something got changed or something's messed up because this should be a very smooth transition. It should not be, it should be 10 seconds. Like literally you turn on the Canon transmitter, you turn on the flash and then you hit the little sync button and the red lights come on and you're synced. If it's not working like that, something is set wrong somewhere. Go reset the flash to its default settings, reset the transmitter to its default setting, and whatever it was, once they're back at their defaults, I think you'll have a you'll it it will it should sync right up. If it doesn't sync right up, it's now it's time to call Canon. Now it's time to call Canon professional services and go, I have a flash that doesn't sync up. There is no way it should take more than 10 seconds. If it does something, something's funky. There may be a hardware issue. I'm going to think it's a software issue, Rubino, but aside from all that, it's nice to see you in the chat, Robin. So hi. Yeah. Okay. Back, back to our chat. All right. <laughs> back so Carl question. has a, Carl has a question. Uh, so Carl's asking, what is the difference between using flash in TTL and using it in manual? Oh my gosh, what a great question. And so I gotta I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a disclaimer up front, Carl. I hate TTL. I don't like it. And I know that people will say, but I've seen Joe McNally use it and he's done great with it. You know why? Because he's Joe McNally. He he works in a different plane than the rest of us. He's the magical unicorn of flash. Joe could do anything. Joe could take a coconut and make a flash. But for the rest of us, TTL is something that the camera companies invented for beginners. And it doesn't work very well, <laughs> which is really bad. It's bad when they invent something for beginners and it doesn't work. But it, it, it's not that it doesn't work. It's that it's incredibly inconsistent. So the idea, the idea of it is going to sound really good. You're going to go, well, that sounds great. The idea is this, you're looking through your lens, your flash also looks through your lens. TTL stands for through the lens metering. It's gonna look through the lens and it's gonna look at the scene you're about to shoot. And it's automatically gonna decide how much light from the flash to let out from the flash. Doesn't that sound great? It would automatically choose the perfect amount of flash. The problem is it's the most inconsistent technology on earth. 
I rate it at the same rating that I do the automatic faucets in the men's room at the airport. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. That's TTL. It is the most inconsistent thing. And because it re-meters every time you look someplace else in the same room, you can have great results and then turn someplace else and shoot a different group of people wearing different clothes and get a completely different reading. And it's just not consistent and it drives you crazy. That's why I recommend for people to turn off TTL and turn on manual mode because manual mode works like this. I'm in a room. I take a shot, and if I look and my, and my flash is too bright, I just go turn down my flash, and my flash will stay at that. Click, 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 click. My flash doesn't change. It doesn't re-meter. It's not constantly rechecking. But then if I notice, ooh, it's a little too dark over here for whatever reason, I just turn the flash up. Now, I've got a wireless transmitter on my flash, so I just go one, two, three. I bring it up three-tenths of a stop. Take a test shot. That's it. It's so simple and so easy and it's consistent. Your flash will stay at the same power unless you change it. So I'm not changing my camera settings. All I'm changing is the power of the flash up or down. Now, during a session, during a shoot, I might only change my power once or twice. Usually when I first set up, like I set up my flash, I get it going, I take a test shot. Oh, it's a little too bright. Let me turn it down. Ooh, still a little too bright. Okay. I won't change my flash the entire time again. I won't touch it one time. If I'm using TTL, if people come in in different outfits, it's changing. It's just, ah. I really, really don't like TTL. And I encourage people not to use it because it just makes you, getting inconsistent results makes people unhappy. So that's why I say use manual mode and take control. All right. Good question. Got it. Carl, thank you. Uh, so I got a, I got a, I got a uh, follow up uh, from uh, earlier with the high speed sync. Just a clarification. This is a quick question from Tony: Is high speed sync kills your flash battery, not your camera battery? Right? Just one that is clarification. Correct. It's your flash battery. That, that is correct. Okay. Good. Thank you, Tony. I did not make that clear. It kills your flash batteries. So bring lots of rechargeable batteries with you. And I don't want to talk you out of using high-speed sync. It's an awesome thing when you use it, but it really, you're going to see your batteries. You're going to burn through them at a rate you never dreamed possible. So it's, it's an investment shooting high-speed sync if you're, if you're not using rechargeable batteries. All right, let's do one more question, and then we'll take a break. So this Absolutely. question is about, uh, at first, uh, can you please explain first curtain? And second curtain uh, flash difference. I'm imagining the rear curtain sync uh, is what they're talking about there. So basically explaining the yeah. first curtain and second curtain. Yeah, and it, it seems like I think it was Joe McNally that said second rear curtain sync should be the default. And what it is is it exposes for the room and then fires the flash instead of them both happen simultaneously. And so you you get kind of a better exposure because it's it's but it's you can also use it for motion effects if you want to get someone to move and freeze and you see a little bit of the motion and stuff but it it really and, and let me give you a good example y your phone right y you know your phone while our phones take really great pictures today their flash pictures are pretty crappy they're just pretty crappy in general let's just say that you're in a restaurant at night and, and you and and you take your phone out and you take a picture of your friend with flash. What does the background behind your flash look like? It's black. It goes black, right? You might as well be shooting in a park at night. You know, you, you don't see the restaurant and the bar and all your friends. If you turn on rear curtain sync, it allows the camera to expose for the room and get an ambient light shot, and then it fires the flash. And the whole picture looks more balanced. You see the restaurant and the bar and the bartender and the flaming cocktails, and then the flash goes off and freezes your subject. So it is a really, really useful thing. I, I turn it on quite a lot when I'm in those situations where I want to capture the ambient light in the room, then I want the flash to come in and freeze the subject. Hope that helps. Yeah, it sounds great. I mean, so um, let's let's do this. Let's take a break. When we come back, uh, we got a bunch of other questions to get to. Um, we'll also have time for a, a few more. So jump into the chat. Give us your questions. We'll get to them. Uh, all talking about Flash here with Scott Kelby. Hi, everybody. Scott Kelby here. And you got hired to do a wedding. Or maybe you're doing an architectural shoot. Maybe you're doing a portrait this weekend. 
What's the right lens for the job? I get asked this question all the time. People say, hey Scott, I'm doing a wedding this weekend. What lenses should I take? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you. I've done an entire class that from beginning to end, we're going to take all these different genres. We're going to do architectural, we're going to do wedding, we're going to do portrait, sports, wildlife, street photography, each genre. What would I tell a friend? What lenses would I tell them to use? And how would I tell them to use them? You're going to learn more about lenses than you ever really wanted to know. We're not going to get into the nerdy stuff, but we're going to get into the stuff that you actually need to know to make good decisions about which lenses to use for which project. We're going to cover a ton of stuff. You're finally going to know what all those acronyms mean, and you're going to know which lens is the right one for the job. So come and check out my brand new class. It's for Canon shooters, and it's found exclusively here at Kelby One. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by Canon. All right. Well, we're well, back. We're back. talking Kelby Flash. Here. Yeah, we're talking Flash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're talking Flash. Yeah. We're running into each other. That's it. Oh, sorry. It's, it's the, <laughs> it's okay. the spacing's a little weird. Hey, can I just mention something about that, that Canon class that I did, the Canon lens class? Mm-hmm. So it, it is a Canon lens class because number one, I, I that's what I have. I, I only have Canon lenses. However, and it's funny because somebody people wrote, you should do a Nikon class. And I said, you know what? It, it would be the same thing. Sony, Nikon, Canon, they all kind of make the same lenses, right? In other words, like I talk about the 70 to 200. Well, Nikon makes one of those. So does Sony. I talk about the 18 to 200. Uh, Canon makes one and Nikon makes one. I, I talk about an 85 1.4. Nikon makes one. Canon. I don't think there's any lenses that I made that I talked about that aren't also made by Sony and Nikon and Tamron and Sigma. I mean, it's like it was, it's, don't just think of it as a lens class for Canon, even though it is all Canon lenses and, and that's what I have and that's what I shoot. Uh, it, if you can get an education about lenses in general and all, because we, we go into all that that stuff, but it really is, if a friend said to me, hey, I got to shoot a wedding next week or I'm going on safari or I'm going to go shoot an air show or whatever, what would you tell me to take? That's what the class is about. And so you will be very easy able to go, wait a minute. He said he would recommend a Canon 7200. Should I take my Nikon 7200? Yeah, that'll work too. So don't don't put your blinders on. <laughs> it's that's okay. You can you can watch it no matter what. 
All right, you ready to get back to some questions? Yeah, I got a great one to follow up from that. Uh, Rehan's asking, this is a hard-hitting Flash question. Uh, so, Scott, why did you switch from Nikon to Canon? I did this six years ago. It was six. <laughs> it was six years ago. You, you're like a little late to the party there. I, am I? Is it seven years yet? It's at least six. Yeah, it was a wow. long time ago. It's a long story. It it started with a friend loan. A got friend at Canon. Now I was a Nikon shooter, and I and I told Canon uh, when I when I originally started shooting. Uh, I mean, when I, when Canon came to us and said, look, you guys are so Nikon centric. Well, was it because Nikon was paying us to be Nikon centric? No, I just, what I had, I just shot Nikon. I'd always shot Nikon. All of my bodies were Nikon. All of my lenses were Nikon. Everything I had was Nikon. So all I ever did was talk about Nikon. Well, Canon came to us and said, Hey, we want to, we want you to mention our stuff too, because you'll hold up a Nikon 7,200. And you never, ever, ever go, oh, yeah, and Canon makes one, too. And I said, that, that's true. <laughs> and they said, we want to sponsor the grid. We want to be a sponsor. And will you and just include us? You don't have to change camera brands. You don't have to ever use our stuff. Just, just mention it. <laughs> just say, and for you Canon shooters, you can just, and I said, okay, fair enough. Because obviously, we have all kinds of different sponsors for different lighting companies and different gels and just all kinds of stuff. So I'm like, sure, we would love to have, you know, Canon as a sponsor, biggest camera company in the world. Yeah, we'd love to have you, but I'm not changing. And I made it really clear. I said, I am not changing. And they're like, we don't want you to expect you to change. You know. So anyway, over time, you, you work with these people and you become friends with them. And one of, one of the guys says, hey, I see you're shooting the game this weekend. And I said, yeah. He goes, one of our guys is going to be at the stadium. Do you, do you want to try out a, a, a 1DX? Now I'd heard all kinds of things about it, right? I heard it was just incredible and all. I'm like, there's not many Nikon users that aren't curious because they're like, everybody out there has Canon but you. Like every glass, everybody's out there with white glass and I'm out there with the, I'm like the black sheep of the, the only black lens, you know? So anyway, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll try it. So I, I took it and I was freaking stunned at how great the autofocus was. I came back with more auto with more shots in focus than any game I'd ever shot in my life. And I was really stunned. And so then I, I made this deal with myself. Okay, they'll loan me some gear. It was just loaner gear. I'm going to shoot sports with with um Canon, and then I'll shoot everything else with Nikon because my travel stuff and my landscape and all this I people, I'm just used to Nikon and I like the way it works and I'm fine with it. And then I was going to Rome for my photo walk. This is a number of years ago. And we had in the video department, because like you're like we shoot on part of our sponsorship was we shoot on Canon cameras. There's a Canon camera on me, a C100 right now. And so they had a, a 5D Mark II. And I took it with me just, well, I'm just going to try it out. What the heck? And I freaking fell in love with it. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. After I made all this big fuss to Canon, I'm never switching. I'm not switching. You're not going to get me switching. They're like, no problem, no problem. And maybe that was their plan all along. At some point, he'll just fall in love with our cameras and he won't be able to say no. And, and you could say, well, wow, they were really smart and that's what they did. But I, I cannot tell you how emphatically I told them that we're happy to have you as a sponsor. We'd love to have you on there. We want to include more people in what we're doing because we don't want anything that we do just to be for a, a one group of people. We want it to be for everybody. So that's the that's the short story. I mean, there's more about things about the cameras and the lenses and the autofocus and all the ergonomics, all that stuff that go. I really like. But at the end of the day, that's how it happened. There you go. Six hey, years so follow-up follow up story um, here on... Uh, on the on the grid here so uh robin went to go get the pdf and now her flash and trigger are talking to each other so she got it working <laughs> i love uh, it i love there it there you go i love it love, love it awesome all right so we got tons happen. of questions to get through here so um yeah. uh so daniel's asking uh scott in the film days i used a light meter but since digital i don't as i recall i've never ha seen you use one either right Right. I, I don't use a flash meter. Uh, now, 
When I used to shoot in the film days, I had to use a flash meter. I had a Minolta flash meter, and I and I lived and died by it, especially because back in those days, I was using a mixture of hot lights and bounce flash. So I had to use a meter. But now, I look on the back of my camera, and if the light looks too bright, you know, the, the little monitors on the back of our cameras today are so good. They are so, so good. They're not 100%, beca and mostly because you're shooting in RAW, and the, the what you're seeing on the back of the camera is a JPEG. So it's a little more saturated and a little more, more beautiful than your shot really will be. However, it's very great for judging light. And so I can look in the back of my camera. I take a shot. I don't have to meter anything. You know who a light meter is really good for, though, in case for those of you who are out thinking there? So once you've gotten really good at flash and you need to, and let's just say that you are a portrait photographer and you have come up with an amount of light that you know works perfectly to light the background and to light your, your key light or your main light and to light your kicker light, right? If you know what that ratio is, like I like my front light one stop brighter than my, my key light and I like my, my uh, light that goes, my flash that goes on the backdrop, I like it two stops brighter to make it solid white. So you have these ratios, that is when a light meter is great. To go to be able to pick up your studio, Go on location and get the exact same quality of light no matter where you go because you're using a mathematical two to one to two ratio. You can hold up the light meter, put it under your subject's chin, make sure the light hitting everything is exactly perfect. Meter the background and know that it's right on the money. There's no guesswork. There's no looking. Is it too bright or is it too dark? You set that power. That's who a light meter today may be still good for. I still don't do that because I don't, my lighting situation changes everywhere I go. But if you wanted to use the same three lights in a repeatable thing everywhere you go, that would be a good case to have a light meter. All right. Uh, so Rose Kieran has a question. Uh, so Rose is asking, um, can I use continuous focus whilst using flash? Well, yeah, I, I don't see why that, that, that would change anything. So continuous focus mode. First, hi, Rose, and welcome. Thank you for joining us all the way from New Zealand. Um, mm -hmm. But continuous focus is a focus mode in your camera that tracks with a moving subject. Now, when you fire your flash, it's going to fire regardless of whether it, it, it doesn't know whether your subject's moving or not. So I don't see any reason in the world continuous focus would interrupt you firing your flash. As long as you're in manual mode, your flash is in sync. It should fire no problem. And that's how you do flash on athletes that are running. And you can have multiple flashes going bang, 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 while your subject's moving. You know, you won't have to use continuous focus as much because the flash will freeze. You know, if you're using a flash uh, at quarter power or something, the stopping power of the flash will freeze motion really, really well. So I don't think that you're going to have to use continuous focus as much, but I don't think it's going to interrupt your flash whatsoever. All righty. All right. So um, Vimo Smith has a question. Are all these questions answers in the flash book? You mean this book right here? Well, these questions and more are in the fantastic flash book. So what the book is, it is I, I cover one thing per page. So if you were to open it up to a particular page, it talks about, you know, one single topic. So rear, rear curtain sink is one page, one picture, one paragraph. So the idea is it, it's not a read it front to back book so much as it is. I need to know how to do this thing. What should I do in this situation? Where should I put the flash? How high does it go? How, how much do I tip it? How do I tip it? Do I, what kind of softbox do I need? All that kind of stuff. It really is a very turn to the page where you want to learn the thing, and, and that's where it is. And we're giving away three of those today, courtesy of our friends at Rocky Nook and the incredible Kim Doty, who is my book editor and who keeps track of all of this stuff and says, you're doing a show on flash. It's time to give away a flash book. All right, so uh, Nina has Nina has an interesting question here. So uh, the question is, are there any situations 
when you should use the camera on camera flash? No. Zero. Never. There is one situation. Two. Two. One. You got a job at the driver's license bureau, and your job is to make people look bad. Or, number two, you're about to take a picture of your ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend's new girlfriend, and you want them to look horrible. You want to get even with them for them doing you wrong. Those are the only two reasons I could ever imagine you using pop-up flash. Pop-up flash is the worst thing that you can do to a person, flash-wise. Part of the problem is the proximity of the flash to the lens. It's born to look bad. It creates red eye. It does horrible things. It's really, it's disgusting, and you should never use it. All right, there we go. All right, so uh, next question from uh, Carl's uh, saying, um, is there a limit to, in softbox size while using flash? So if you're using a softbox, is there a limit to the size of the softbox? Well, I mean, there probably is, but I haven't found it yet because I've used my flash with a seven-foot parabolic umbrella. I've used it with giant, big, big softboxes. It's just this. The bigger the softbox, the more light you're going to have to push. My general, with a regular size softbox, 24 inch, 32 inch, regular one, I'm going to be at one quarter power. Okay, one quarter power. If I get to a, a 72 inch, I'm probably going to be at three quarters power, maybe full power, because it's going to have to fill this big thing before the light leaves it. So it, that's the only limitation is you're going to have to turn up the power of your flash. Maybe not as much as I'm saying. Maybe I'm going from a quarter to a half. Maybe the thing I uh oh uh oh um and not had a problem. Did my flash? Did my uh -oh. did I cut out? Yeah, you did cut out. But guess what? We're it's perfect timing because we need to take a break. But we, when we come back, uh, we have uh, uh tons more questions. We're going to be giving away those uh books uh from Scott uh, Scott's flash book. And we'll be back in just a few minutes, back talking about Flash with Scott Kelby. KB1 members, Eric Kuna here. Join me for my new class, Demystifying Milky Way Photography. We're going to go over the Milky Way settings you need to be able to get started. We're going to go over the gear, we're going to go over the apps, and then we're going to actually go out and shoot the Milky Way. We're going to do a bunch of different styles, a bunch of different settings, so you can kind of put this all together and start mastering Milky Way photography today. Join me on my new class at kelby1.com. Hey everybody, I want to talk to all the photographers out there who kind of know their way around lighting. You kind of understand what a wireless trigger is, what an off-camera flash is. You're kind of comfortable with all that stuff. This is for you. In this class, I'm going to take you on a lighting journey. So we're in this beautiful classic theater. We've got a ballerina for the whole day. And we're gonna do a bunch of different lighting looks. We're gonna start backstage in the dressing room. Then we go into a very ugly hallway. Then we're going into the wings. We're gonna do that shot right before the ballerina is gonna take the stage. So I had this idea in my mind of what, how I wanted to light everything. Didn't always work out. So you're gonna see the good, the bad, and the ugly. You're gonna see everything step by step as it unfolds. You're gonna get the settings. You're gonna see the whole thing. And the cool thing is it's all done with the greatest lights ever. I'm using Profoto and they are amazing lights and it's kind of what saved the day because the simplicity of the lights let me deal with everything else. 
come and check out my brand new class on intermediate level lighting. I'm using Profoto B1Xs and a D2, three lights and all. You're gonna love it and it's exclusively here at Kelby One. This segment of The Grid is brought to you by Platypod, the world's most compact tripod base. Make sure you don't miss any episodes of The Grid by subscribing to Apple's podcast app or iTunes. It's free, and we even have a special audio-only version, too. So sign up today. Hello, everyone. We're back. Hey, um, you know, we're giving away a flashbook here in just a few minutes. But Kim, my, my editor, just let me know. So two weeks ago, I did a thing called uh, a book chat where we just basically talked about my three of my books, my landscape book, my natural light book, and the, my flash book. And uh, Rocky Nook, the publisher, uh, gave a 50% off deal. So if you bought all three, um, it was 50% off. What was great was a, a staggering amount of books were sold that night, like just a staggering amount, more than we ever had anticipated. But but the link is still up. It's still live over at Rocky Nook. And let me see if I can give you the link because Kim just texted me. And if she sends me the link, I'm going to share it with you. Uh, but give me a sec because I had to turn off my phone because of the, the computer kept calling me. It was weird. Uh, all right. It is go to Rocky Nook. Oh, you can do, let's say, yeah, here's the, let me give you the. Oh, there's got to be a shorter URL than this. <laughs> oh, this is very long, mm. but it's it's a book bundle. Yeah, the print and ebook bundle, all three of them for the print and ebook. So you get both for 50 bucks. Or you can get just No, that's it. That's it. That's the deal. So that's like incredibly good deal. I think it's yeah, over 50% off the cover price. That's really good. But I, it, there's a there's a better URL. It's rockynook.com. I think it's like Scott Book Chat or something. But I, I'm sure Kim will let me know here in just a minute. But it, it is a great deal. And you you're and they ship immediately. You know, Amazon's been making you wait like two weeks for everything or three weeks for books. They ship like tomorrow. So, hey, Scott. Yes. S Scott, it's rockynook.com forward slash book chat. Oh, okay. RockyNook.com forward slash book chat. Thank you, Eric. But yeah, it's it's 50 bucks for three books, the print book and the ebook. That's ridiculously low, like crazy berserko. Berserko low. Well, I guess that's why so many people bought, bought it and took advantage of it. But we were never expecting that. But I'm going to do another book chat and and uh, we've, we've got some of the kinks worked out from my first book chat. I was an adapter away from making it all work. Here's there the adapter go. right there. One adapter away from a, the dream. Anyway, we'll do another one here soon because it was it was actually a lot of fun and people were great. And I didn't get to do all of the fun and games I had planned on doing. I wanted to do a dramatic reading from the uh, one of the chapter intros. And I had some quizzes and eh, it didn't all work out the way I'd hoped. But that's the way this crazy, loopy, Internet only world is. So we want to get back to some questions, Mr. K. Yeah, we got tons of questions coming in. Um, so uh, another one is, um, you know, people notice that you don't like umbrellas. Why don't you like umbrellas? <laughs> I kind of describe umbrellas as like a lighting grenade. <laughs> the light doesn't stay as focused as you would like it to. One of the things I like about a softbox is your light is enclosed in an area and it kind of goes in that direction. It does spread, but not like an umbrella. Um, I, I, I think that is a big part of it is the um, they seem to take up less space in real life, not in transport, but in once you set them up. Uh, number one and number two is it really I think I, I have more control I've always felt like I had more control with a softbox than I do with an umbrella and I've used both I've got umbrellas I've used big parabolics uh, and I've, I've just I really really prefer a, uh, a softbox also a softbox often will have uh, a lot of options that you won't have with an umbrella for example they will have inside the softbox a thing to reduce the hot spot so before the diffuser, inside the softbox, there's a, a 
don't know what it's called, another diffusion panel to keep you from having that very, very bright hot spot. So that softens and spreads it. And then it hits the outside of the soft box. They also have plates, circular plates that you can put inside like a beauty dish attachment. So your, your flash hits this curved plate. It's con. It's either concave or convex. It's a, letter, a word that begins with C. Your light hits it. It goes back into the soft box and it turns and goes back out. So it's it gets a little softer than it would shooting through an umbrella. So there's just a number of different um, uh, benefits to it that that I, I feel over a an umbrella. I'm not a fan of umbrellas. And I do have them and I've used them and I can use them. But given the choice, I'll always take a soft box for control. All right, so Diane's asking a question here, and Diane's asking the best way to light deep shadows in macro shots. So talking about macro shots with flash. I've got to be honest with you. I, I'm not a, ma a macro flash photographer. When I do shoot macro, I'm shooting using natural light. So honestly, anything that I would say would be a guess. So unfortunately, I, I just don't know. And so I, I don't want to just throw something out there. So my answer is, I don't know. I'm sorry. That's the outside of my realm of flashness. All righty. So uh, Barry's asking a question, and Barry's saying, uh, can you talk about feathering your light modifier and what it does? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Feathering is one of my favorite things um, in, in flash photography. So you just heard me talk about a, the hot spot in the middle, right? So let's picture, can I use anything here? There's nothing here. Let's picture a round thing. <laughs> Let's say it's a very small soft box. In the middle where your flash is, it's going to be the brightest. So there's a hot spot. It's called a hot spot in the middle. We call it a hot spot. We even put diffusion panels so you have less of a hot spot. But in general, if this is our, our front of our soft box, it's brightest and harshest in the middle. And as you go out, it gets softer. So rather than aiming your flash, so let's say that this... Let's say this wonderful book here is my flash. If you aim it directly at me with the center facing at me, it's going to be its harshest. However, if I take the light and watch the book, and I turn it to where it's almost flat. So it looks like I'm lighting someone standing over there, like to my, to my left. Then I'm only getting the light that's at the edge of the softbox. I'm only getting the softest and most beautiful light from that flash. So what this is called, the act of turning the flash from here to there is feathering it out. So you're feathering the light, you get softer, better quality of light. I do it very, 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 very often where the light is directly beside, not at a 45 degree angle, and it creates very beautiful light. Now, you, you don't want it to you, you want to make sure that you turn your subject and you tell them we have one light kind of you got to play a little to that light because what you don't want is split light. I'm, I mean, there are cases where you do Hollywood or whatever, but you don't want the light to go down the middle of their face, lighting this side and darkening that one. So if my light was here, I would just have my subject turning and I tell them, you know, play a little towards the light. So. And then it, it falls onto this side of their face as well. But um, actually, if you wait one second, I might be able to show you an example. What I mean by okay. a feathered look. Yeah, hang tight so, one yeah, while, second. While you're looking up that, um, there was a question from Dan that I, I think uh, I could actually answer. So, um, Oh, yeah, please do. Uh, don't you need an on-camera flash for photojournalism, covering press conferences and the like? And actually, I could say that... Um, Yes, sometimes you need an on-camera. I would say you never need your pop-up flash. You should never be using right. your pop-up flash. And the right. on-camera flash, in that setting, maybe. But I will say that if I'm using an on-camera flash, it's only to do a little bit of fill. And it's kind of very balanced to where you're just kind of like adding stuff to the shadows. Uh, but most of the time, I find it better to just not use an on-camera flash. And actually just start playing, you know, just basically play to the exposures. Usually when you're shooting press conferences, I'll be honest, mostly they're lit pretty good because they're press conferences. And nowadays they're being televised or on the Internet. So I would actually rather use ISO and, and, and shutter speed and that kind of stuff to control that light than 
bring in my own flash. Um, I agree too. If if I can get away with using ambient room light and I'd rather much rather raise my ISO. However, there will be situations where you cannot, you've been hired to cover an event. You're too far away from the, from there's not enough ambient light. You're in a ballroom at the Hilton and you're going to have to use not the pop-up flash. Good call, Mr. Kuna, not the pop-up flash. But in those cases, you're not trying to make a beautiful portrait. You're Mm -hmm. doing it for journalistic purposes. You're just trying to record who was there and a well illuminated picture will work better. That's the only time I would take that flash and put it on top. Now, also there's there's certain situations like when the bride and bride's getting ready at a wedding, you're not going to walk around while she's ready with with a boom arm coming in with a, a flash, you know. Sometimes you're going to have to bounce the flash off the low ceiling of a hotel room or something. Uh, but for the most part, this is for putting your camera on top is for event photography. It is you're covering a meet and greet, the the governor's giving you an award, you know, something like that. And you're not trying to make a beautiful portrait. You're just trying to record like you're you're a newspaper reporter. Yeah, you're going to have to use a flash. Okay, take a look on my screen if you can see it. This is an example of me feathering the light. You can see where the subject would be sitting, but they're aiming to the left, right? So here's their head would be here and their legs would be here. And they're going, I'm standing way over this side. I'm over to the left. See how the light is almost going right past them? And all that's really hitting my subject is this outside edge. Hot spot, bright in the middle, softer, softer, softer. There it is, feathering. That's the that's some that's some feathering right there, folks. There you go. There you go. All right. So uh hey, I got a what? question here. Wait, Eric, oh. wait, 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 wait. Mm-hmm. I might even have a video of me feathering it. Hold on. Or or I don't. Wait, maybe it's right here. Rats, I thought I had a video of me actually showing how to feather the light. And I do not have it with me. Where is it? Well, wherever it is, it's not right where I'm standing. So I don't have. Wait a minute. Is this it? No. All right. I tried. <laughs> Sorry. All right. false alarm. So I got, false alarm. I got another question for you, Scott. Sure. And that is, um, if I don't, if somebody doesn't have, a, if I don't have a softbox, uh, what about putting one of those white plastic domes over my flash to soften or spread the light? It's, it's not ideal. It is your last resort. Like if you don't have a soft box, it'll, it will help minimally. It is not going to replace a soft box. It's not, it's just not going to. I, now remember the thing I told you about Magmod and the gels, Magmod, one of their kits beside a gel they had a, a white orb. It's it's a foldable, like you could really take it and shove it in your pocket. And when you open it, it goes floop and it goes back into shape. That thing's not bad. It's not ideal, but it's way better than the little plastic dome. Those plastic domes that you that come with your camera, honestly, they they do very little. Oh, there's my dogs. So my dogs are barking because Amazon must be here. And if Amazon's here, they lose their mind. So Amazon delivery happens every time. Okay, back to our story. There you go. Now, but if if I if it was a friend and I was going to go look, you want I know you can't under afford a hundred fifty dollars softbox because that's what it costs to get a nice uh, rapid box kit like from Westcon. Let me let me show you what the one I would get first. Let me go to B and H B and H. Let's go to Westcott Rapid Box. And honestly, it's it's the best softbox for flash. Uh, right here. This is the one I would get, the 26 Octa. But hold on, let me hit. Let me go back one. I hit a crazy button. They have a kit right here. Uh, that's two of them. Here it is, right here. This is what I would get. It's 149, 150 bucks, right? It is the soft box. It is the tilty bracket that comes with it. So the bracket tilts and it holds your hot shoe. You got a little circle that holds this. It's got a diffuser in the front. It snaps together in like 30 seconds. I kid you not. 
and it comes with the flash stand and it comes with a holder it hold it has a whole kit that holds it together and a deflector plate that was the name i was thinking of earlier the little convex or concave or whatever the consing concave thingy uh, that that's would be my go-to but if you go scott i just don't have 150 bucks to spend then you need a one-stop diffuser just a circular one-stop diffuser and you put it between your flash and the um the diffuser, it spreads and softens the light. Give me two seconds. I think I can show you what that looks like. Don't move, don't breathe, don't make a sound. I think I can show you what a one-stop diffuser looks like. I'm very close to finding a picture of a one-stop diffuser. All right, here we go. This is a one-stop diffuser. I talk about this on my, that's not it. No. I don't have it on screen. There, that's that's a one-stop diffuser. It's a big circle. You put your flash on a stand and you fire it through that thing. It spreads the light. You can get them for like 10 bucks, right? Like 10 bucks. If on location, it looks like that. Get a friend or an assistant to hold the diffuser. And it's... It, it's like a soft, it's the same as using a softbox about. It's it's not quite as good. It doesn't um, corral the light quite as well, but it softens and spreads it, and it's beautiful. That's it, 10 bucks. That's what's standing between you and beautiful light. Don't let that stand between you. It's 10 bucks. So there you go. So a uh, follow up there uh, Jeffrey's asking uh, about the Westcott Rapid Box Octa. Uh, yeah. Would this be favorable on a monopod to run and gun? Absolutely. Perfect. The perfect size to run and gun. So what you can do, Jeffrey, and you you already know you can do it for those of you who are, who are uh, wondering, you can buy a monopod and screw it on the end and it, and you can do a wedding or whatever you want and, and run and gun and have beautiful light wherever you go. Now there's two things you can do. Uh, Impact actually makes a monopod designed for lights with a light screw on the end of it. It's already got the little... So if you buy a monopod, you still need an adapter to be able to attach the tilt bracket, right? You need a spigot. But I'm going to find it for you on B&H because that's what we do. Let's. It's Impact. It's an Impact arm. Impact boom arm? You have to come up with just the right name. Impact boom arm let's see if that's it that is not it hold on because it's its own thing you hold it in your hand there it is it is the impact quick stick it is a telescopic handle for 28 bucks and it has little handles on the end to make it easier to hold than a monopod it telescopes out to 64 inches and it comes with a spigot on the end designed to attach a competing softbox. But you can see, look, it's it's a it's the same thing. It's a bracket and a softbox. And right in there, boom, bada, boom. Looks like that when you use it. There you go. It looks like our editor from Photoshop User Magazine. It looks like Chris Maine. <laughs> Yeah, it does holding look like that Chris Maine. <laughs> with Elvis. It's Elvis and Chris Maine. Doesn't it look like Chris? Yeah, it does. All right, back to our story because those of you who don't know Chris. But anyway, that's it. It's got the little bracket. It's got the spigot. It's twenty six bucks. Really good for run and gun. There you go. B and H is is uh, being very handy today. <laughs> there you go. Having the internet, the internet, the interwebs. All right, All right, we are so, we are way 15, 15 yes, minutes over time. So if you got any last questions, we better ask them now. Uh, well, I've got a few more questions, and maybe we could kind of uh, lightning round them. So, um, so right. is there a way to shoot wide open f stops when shooting indoors with flash? Yes, get an ND filter. Like, get a filter that screws on the front of your camera that makes it think it's darker than it is. <laughs> so, because the problem is. Getting your, your flash low enough, your flash power low enough, 
it's it's easier with flash than it is with studio strobes. But if you run into a, a problem with that, you want a decent amount of light, but you want to be able to shoot at f2.8, put a three-stop ND on there, that'll that'll do it for you. That's a lightning round answer. There's more to it than that, but that's, that's a lightning round answer. Um, yeah, so uh, is it okay to have two catch lights? Uh, and which is the preferred shape sure. for those catch lights? Forget about catch lights. So here's the thing. As long as there is one, it doesn't really matter. No one's looking at catch lights but other photographers. Don't be a nerd. Stop worrying about catch lights. Nobody cares if there's two or there's 14 or whatever it is. It's just a reflection of whatever the light was. So the clients don't don't know what it is. If you go to your client and go, how many catch lights would, would you like? They're going to go, what? Catch lights in the eyes. How many do you want? What's a catch light? It's the little white dot. What? Yeah, it's only other photographers. It's a nerd trick. Don't fall for it. Okay, go on. All right. Um, best settings for flash and uh, for wildlife. <laughs> I have no idea. There you go. I have no idea. I don't shoot wildlife with flash, and I shoot very little wildlife. But I don't. I'm sorry. I I just don't do it. I have no idea what the settings would be. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, how does ETTR? So I'm guessing exposing to the right. Uh, influence uh, flash. How does that influence flash? Exposing to the right. <clears throat> I don't know. There we go. I I don't expose right. to the right. And I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you in one sentence how I feel about it. I don't really know any top pros at all that expose to the right, but I know lots of amateurs that do. Next. Okay, <laughs> for that. All right. Uh, well, before we get, uh, we we have um, the winners for our contest, so we got to we got to get to that before yes. we wrap up here. So, Let's do that. Uh, uh, the winners. So I've got uh, uh, Christina sent the winners. So we have Nina, uh, one one of the copies of the flash book. Uh, Gail D, uh, one one as well, and then Julia Gavalit, I believe is how you pronounce it. Um, uh, one another one. So uh, reach out to Christina in the chat uh, or just email kdoty at kelby1.com and uh, we'll get you hooked up with that flashbook. But there I think go. we should probably wrap up. We, we could keep on going. We got tons of questions. No, but I think it's I think, a good uh, idea. <laughs> we got to wrap Dude, up. Dude, once you start to get exposed to the right questions, it's time to go. Yeah. yeah. Time to go. That's your cue. So, yeah. Well, cool. All right. Well, hey, thanks, thanks just a reminder answer. don't forget. I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks for answering all What'd those. You say? I, know, I know people appreciated it. Oh yeah, no, no, I I, I love Flash Q and A Day. I love Flash. Flash is a blast. Uh, just want to remind you, next Tuesday we're doing the Lightroom conference. We'd love to have you there. Go to LightroomConference.com for all the details. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be teaching an all day seminar for photographers in the northeast of the northeastern United States. If you want to join me, it's my full a uh, photography crash course. I'm doing the entire thing. So if you're in a Northern state, and you'd like to join us tomorrow, go to Kelby one live L I V E.com and jump on it. Cause we got a ton of photographers signed up for tomorrow. would love to have you join us as well. That's tomorrow. And I'm doing the whole thing live, just like I do it, you know, in, in person, but without the germs and the virus. So jump online tomorrow with us and uh, anything else to add, Mr. Kuna? No, just after I think after the uh, we wrap here, uh, Jason's going to play the uh, video that explains the Lightroom conference to people if they want to stick oh, around good. and watch it. So, good, good, go. good. All right, so let's go. Thank let's, you, Mr. Let's Kuna. do that, and we'll see you next week. Yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, thanks to Ron and to Jason who are working uh, very far away from each other uh, to make this all happen. So, thank to you guys. Thanks to Christina who is helping us out uh, in the chat because she runs our whole video department. So <laughs> nothing really happens with video without her. Uh, so thank you to her. And thanks to all of you for watching, spending some time with us. Stay healthy. Wash those hands. Stay the heck indoors. Stay away from everybody. See you next time.
You know how you've been saying to yourself, I would love to get really good at Lightroom. I would love to get super organized and really learn how to edit my images like a pro. And I want to learn how to print from Lightroom and work with presets and plugins and all these things that the pros are doing. But I never have the time. Well, now that we actually have the time, we've got the solution. And it's one we're really excited about because it's a live online learning experience. And creating live events, that's our jam. We are the same folks who've been producing the annual Photoshop World Conference since back in the 90s. And today we're launching a new live learning experience for Lightroom users everywhere, and we want you to be a part of it. So come and join us for the Lightroom Conference. It's a live two-day multi-track conference, and it's delivered completely online, so no matter where you are in the world, you can be a part of it. We've brought together the best Lightroom instructors in the world, including trainers like Matt Kluskowski, Rob Sylvan, Christy Shirk, Terry White, Serge Ramali, and the editor of Lightroom Magazine and the author of How Do I Do That in Lightroom? That's, that's me, by the way. <laughs> Look, you're gonna learn more about Lightroom in just two days than you ever thought you could. Plus, you'll have exclusive on-demand access to the entire conference afterwards. So you can go back and rewatch any session again or watch sessions that you might have missed during the two-day event. We'll also have late night sessions on the best Lightroom plugins, one-on-one -on -one Q and A's with our instructors and lots of fun surprises along the way. Best of all, we've made this entire conference super affordable so anybody, anywhere can join in. So come spend a few days with us and focus on something really positive, on being creative, on growing your skills, on getting totally immersed in learning and laughing and supercharging your Lightroom skills. You can sign up right now for the Lightroom conference at kelby1live.com and then we'll see you there May 5th and 6th, 2020 as the world's best instructors come together for this unique Lightroom learning experience. And we'll see you online.